Okay. Very good. Okay. 17, 1931. Okay. So, yeah. Emission Nebula, so, and Cepheus, so. I should move that over. So this website is called darkflats.com. Hmm. Works in progress. So it's probably some personal. Yeah. Thing, but it looks like pretty busy guy though. Let's see. Let's, let's see what's the home here. Let's. I'm going to click on home first. Home, any names here? What's this? Ryan is setting early west. Up like galaxies. I don't see any names associated with this here. Who this person is? Oh, hmm. they're about me. Here's what I can find. My name is Jonathan. I have a passion for exploring. <laughs> That's yeah, Jonathan. Okay, great. Sorry, how, how did this come up? Because uh, Dick was saying that he was working on CED 214. Oh, and okay. That's, yeah. And that's one of the things this website, this guy was working on in what date? Uh, last year, November 25th, last year when he took this shot. Okay. Fraction, yeah. so, so if you got to fraction lines, what's that mean? It depends where the diffraction lines are. It could mean that it's in a taken by a reflector, or if you see diffraction rings, it could mean it's very, uh, very, very good seeing. Really? Or they, or they just added it in while editing. That's also a possibility. Some people like this stuff. <laughs> yes, they do. I, I ran into a fellow that did that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're very pretty. Yeah. Matter of fact, he had a, a refractor. And he was showing me pictures that looked like this. And then he showed me that he put fishing line in, a, in an X pattern on the front of his aperture to mm -hmm. give those diffraction patterns because he liked the way it makes stars look. <laughs> just fishing line was, <laughs> was enough to give that pattern. Yeah, wow. just some yeah, thread or fishing line or something, whatever. In the old days, when it was all visual, they used to use make reticles in, um, in eyepieces by teasing spiders and hooking it on one side and then letting the spider whip out its web as he drug it across the other side of a ring and tacked it down. Wow. So they were fairly delicate, but they were really fine. When they wanted to do fine micrometer work, that's the type of eyepiece or crosshairs they'd use. Good evening, Mike. Hey, how's it going? You're in Good. your dome, huh? Yes, I am. <laughs> wow. The first time in many a day, and uh, um, I'm going through the uh, usual um, software troubleshooting uh, foo bars, you know, that everybody seems to have. So the dome doesn't point where it's supposed to be, so I'm trying to figure it out tonight. So, so show, show, us, show us your telescope behind you. What, what do you got there? Okay, so let's see. Up here. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, uh, a C11 on a MISU mount. And I'm slewing it now, and you probably can't hear anything. Oh, there's a little bit. <clears throat> so uh, not sure if I got this in. Okay, so the only thing special that I did to it is to put this uh, counterweight on here. Mm. Right here, which was designed for the C11 when it was on a fork mount, but that allows me to adjust the, the weight distribution because this is a friction drive. And so this is my CDS 600 scope. 
I mean, uh, camera. Uh huh. Yeah, this is my ZWO one seventy eight, which I it's my planetary, uh, uh, but I use it for uh, auto guiding because it's got extremely small pixels and high brightness. So, uh, so, so uh, yeah, it's a you know, that's the other side. So this is the, the Misu mount here. And let's see here, I'm running out of cord. This is the, the extra sturdy uh, here that I built out of uh, thick steel tubing and the legs here were part of old uh, bicycle uh, uh, stands. And so, uh, so anyways, so this is, I don't slow it too fast. I like the protection you give your finder. Yeah, I know, I'll drink to that. Um, <laughs> that's because I, I lost the old one, and here I can, the wind doesn't blow it too bad. How's, how's the weather in your area? Oh, it looks clear. Yeah, it looks it's good. It's clear, and that's the, uh, the tough shed. Can you hear the geese? Hear the what? Geese are flying over. Don't hear a thing. Okay. Anyways, so uh, <laughs> hey, we're in a submarine. Oh boy! Uh, you know, and here's this wonderful car chair that I uh, that becomes very uncomfortable after about a couple hours of sitting down, making sure everything is uh, is proper. So there you got the. The grand tour, but you can so, you can work remotely, right? Theoretically, I can only when I get the stupid dome operating properly. So that, that's the uh, the thing that I'm fighting right now is the the dome the the uh, the slip motor doesn't work um, on remote. Uh, and this, the dome seems to be 180 degrees out, even though I've been following all the instructions. So uh, it's just like, you know, what are you going to do? Fight with it, you know. Uh, your, so, your dome, is it a next dome? Is that what that is? It is a next dome, yeah. I mean, other than that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little small inside, you know, could, you know, 10 foot is really the minimum size that you really want to have if you're going to get a, a dome. Because um, um, one, the, the, I can I can demonstrate for you where just rotate the uh, there's the counterweight, okay, and it gets pretty close to the uh, to the door in a lot of instances. So. You're doing the limbo uh, dance uh, when you're getting in. So I can Is that the home now. position? Uh, well, it's pointing north. That's that's pointing north. So, so anyways, um, what we may do with what we've got, and I'll you know, I'll use it until my my decrepitude gets to the point that. I need something better to get inside. You know, it's, uh, you got to be kind of spry to, to get in here because the, the doors are rather low. Okay. So, uh, did, did you buy a door? I mean, your dome uh, control motor from Next Dome, or did you come and yes, get yes. it? Oh, you did? Yeah, it's supposed to be a canned solution, but I've had some issues. And I think um, the the shutter is supposed to be the shutter's controlled 
by a, a Zigbee, uh, an XB uh, uh, link, and that has not been working since day one. And uh, so I wound up, uh, I wound up uh, having a little remote switch on there so that I could have it go up and down. Um, and the, uh, the dome rotation, basically what it is, you hook it up to a USB cable to your laptop and it's got an RF link in here to the uh, shutter motor and that's not working. This is working, but the way that they calibrate it uh, in the, um, they built the software expecting you to put the motor at the north, um, at, at true north, and mine's at true south just because um, all the bad weather comes from the west and from the north. And so I don't want any rain blowing against the, uh, the dome shutter that's to keep any possibility of rain out. And, and also I have my, uh, my, uh, whoops, okay. I've got a bay here, I got a single bay. I, I should have got another one, but that's where I sit. And I sit to the south because if I was sitting to the north, um, I'd have to watch out for the uh, counterweight coming at you. Yeah. So- uh, Well, it wouldn't hit you very fast. No, it wouldn't, but with a friction mount, I'd screw up my alignment. Yeah. So um, anyways. Um, well, isn't there mic encoders that tell the, the mount where it's at, even if it's friction that you? No. Uh, the way that it, it um, the new MISOs actually don't have those. Vine has it, you know. Um, there's the axis of encoder over here, but that's relatively uh, coarse. It's like uh, about four or five arc minutes per tick. It's it's a forty ninety six count. So oh, okay, so it's about two arc minutes per tick. But still, you don't want to uh, bump the mount because then you lose your your pointing. Yeah, and, and so uh, screw up your photo. Well, yeah, you could you could be off quite a bit, and I'm not sure how the side tech software would handle. Oh, I've been moved, even though I'm not supposed to move, you know, but, you know, right now, I mean, it, you know, with the C11, it, you know, 30 seconds to 60 seconds tracking without need for auto guiding is pretty good. Um, C8, with the C8 on there, I was getting anywhere between 60 seconds and 180 seconds of uh tracking where I had round stars without uh, auto guiding. Now, one of the things that's gonna be changed on here pretty shortly is that this camera is gonna be replaced by a brand new camera that I bought with Woodland Hills camera. I, I went out and plunked down a lot of money on a QHY 410C, which is a full frame 35 millimeter um sensor with uh was a 5.94 micron pixels i wanted to get a camera with uh wide dynamic range the widest i could and the full well capacity on that is about 120,000 uh, electrons and the reason for that was i think with the light pollution i have and the objects I want to shoot, um, I'd be saturating a lot of stars and stuff. I'd, I'd be losing um, the color out of the stars trying to get the faint stuff. So I think this um, this camera will give me the, the widest dynamic range. Mm -hmm. And it's got uh, the QHY um, camera. Um, they're talking about under two um, electron volts per second uh, noise in high gain mode. And I think about three electron volt, three electrons uh, 
in uh, Logine. So that was better than the competition. So I figured for me, having a camera with uh, lower noise aids me in getting uh, detail out of more light polluted areas. So just because um, another thing too is the, the, the glass on it is not um, a, a UVIR filter. Um, according to QHY on the larger chips like this one, uh, not the APS-C size, but on the larger chips, um, you get bloated stars if you put that right at where the uh, sensor is. And so what they did was put a uh, anti-reflection uh, window that has the coatings on both sides. And that's supposed to reduce um, the bloating of the stars, the bright stars. And that's one thing I've been fighting with this camera over here. Um, How about camera. vignetting? Uh, do you think you're going to have trouble with vignetting with this, such, such a large camera? Um, I will have vignetting, but I did some flat fields and it wasn't too bad. Um, no. I will live with vignetting, okay, just so that I have a camera that will last me on just about any type of uh, setup. Now, the pixels are larger, so it's designed for a longer focal length uh, telescope. This is f10, we're at 6.3. And in both cases, I get a resolution less than an arc second. Um, per pixel size. Um, you know, I could have gone with a, a camera with a, a smaller sensor, could have saved myself a lot of money. Um, but I wanted that full well um, capability uh, of the camera. Um, and talking with Tony Hallis, he is in love with this QHY 410. So, you know, I figured, well, it was within the ballpark of my pain of threshold of uh, financial uh, uh, business, uh, kind of high, but um, compared to uh, some of the cameras that people have been spending, you know, over the years, it's not totally unreasonable. I mean, for a, a, a CCD camera with, a, was it the 16,800? sensor or something like that, you're looking at something more expensive. So uh, so it's a color camera or mono? It's a one shot color camera. OK, so it's the QHY367 Pro C. Is that the one? 410. 410, OK. 410. Yeah. So uh, um, actually, ZWO makes a version of that too, but for whatever reason, they don't get as good a performance out of it. And the glass isn't um, a UVIR filter, which um, they don't state it, but on a sensor that size, you'll get bloated stars. So I just decided this. I just decided to, to spend the money. I mean, I I, I was sure. about this far away from buying the QHY. I think it's a 2400, I think, or something like that. I mean, the, excuse me, the ZWR 2400, which has got the same uh, 410 sensor. And and with the money, because they, they lowered the price from $3,600 down to 29. And with that extra money, I was, I was thinking, seriously thinking, well, I can get it. Of excess guider and a filter wheel. And then I started really thinking about what I'm going to do with this camera. And so uh, for now, I'll just be screwing in the filter into the adapter in the camera and taking pictures that way. Uh, it's uh, so, anyways. Um, okay. Looks good. Yeah. So I'm curious uh, how you, how it's going to work. I, I wonder if because the C11 doesn't have a totally flat field. I mean, for that you would need an Edge HD, right? So if you have a larger sensor, you might uh, run into some uh, 
I might from, run into that, but I've got the 0.63 um, uh, reducer and that tends to flatten it a okay. reasonable amount. Yeah. And that might be a, a better setup for most of the objects I have anyways. Um, I'd be doing F10 for like planetary nebula and galaxies where you would put it right in the middle, right? Yeah. Um, and not the large gases nebulas. I'm not, I'm not too sure there's that many gaseous nebulas where um, where the, the, the field of view is that small. And with the six three, you know, uh, it'll it'll be a lot uh, a lot faster. That that puts it in the, the reasonable exposure range. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. what about a hyperstar? I mean, that you would really benefit from that, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I don't think a hyperstar would cover a full 35 millimeter. But, oh, okay. yeah. um, but if, if I, you know, it's one of those things where you, you, you figure out how much pain do you want. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if it doesn't cover, if it covers three fourths, really good. Okay, it's still a bigger sensor than an APS-C, right? So, uh, or, or close to it. I just wanted a camera that I could say, okay, I could put it on just about any telescope. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it would be more than good for it. Um, of course, yeah, Jordan probably has an opinion differently, but... <laughs> yeah. Move, moving that, that kind of equipment around is not so simple, I found, because I, you know, I've got everything now on my 12-inch uh, newt, and I built a special rig for it that uh, controls all these things that I need. So it's like the, the autofocuser, the, the sensor, the off-axis guider, and, and the cooler, and so on. And you need special so power supplies for that. It, it's sort of all oh, that's more or less tied together. So I can't just simply move it over to my Mac newt or to my, uh, you know, uh, my, my red cat. <laughs> so well, I, still, I, I have to buy another powered USB hub to, to feed the beast. And <laughs> I have a friend, uh, Mark, who has a, um, a CDK 12 inch. He has the AS, uh, ASI 8 inch, um, uh, I forget the name of it. It's the Rick. Rick it's the Italian name, I forget what it is. Eight inch F3, ultra wide angle. Um, and a, a couple of refractors all on his, uh, his telescope mount. And he does move his cameras between one and another. He does that all the time. So, but it's on the same telescope mount. Huh. So, you know, so it's just, you know, think, think of this setup, but you've got a couple other telescopes uh, one time it was the 12 inch with a, a 130 Takahashi with the, the ASI and uh, a Red Cat. You know, he's got like 100 pounds or so counterweight on the other end. <laughs> yeah, if you leave it on the same mount, then it's, I guess it's okay. I could do that too. But I was, I, wa I wanted to run something on my uh, AVX. I wanted to run the Red Cat with an auto guide on my AVX. And yeah. Uh, then, you know, you've got all kinds of things that it doesn't really fit. So I'll, I'll have to rig up something special and I'll probably end up using my DSLR just like Dick does for the time being. Yeah, anyway, well, I have uh, one image to share this uh, full proof. Let me see here if I can share something. Uh, just something really simple. I don't, uh, so that's my, an image of my um, uh, new barn door drive. I wanted something. Uh, Jerry, you haven't uh, been there around for two weeks or so, right? No. Okay, so I, I do have a picture of the Barden door drive. I, I just wanted to, I would have liked to build that Barden door drive before I went to uh, Stella Fane, but it didn't happen. So uh -huh. just so you know. Or did you take pictures at Stella Fane? I did uh, just of some Milky Way pictures. Um, oh, I mean, I mean of the people and of their scopes. Oh, yes, I did a lot actually, and I, I showed them. Um, um, so, yeah, Jerry, you can look that. I wasn't show here up. for that. Yeah, you can look it up on the YouTube video. Okay, you know. I will. Yeah, so so this here is my little uh, barn door drive. It's actually a, a bigger barn door drive than I had uh, done before. 
there's some space here that allows for for a, a tell rad so you're not I, showing it now it uh, you went back to your original picture i see okay hold on a second um i'll, I'll click on new share then i guess um oh i see what it is. yeah so that's better if that's yeah there it is mm -hmm. um so yeah there's some space here for a tell rad so you first align that with the hinge and then you align the the barn door with the, the northern celestial pole I've got a nice uh, uh, ball <coughs> head right there. and this is the battery and that piece of rubber keeps the thing from flipping over so you lose all your equipment. It almost happened to me one time. And this is the Arduino with the screw. It, it corrects for the straight screw. So anyway, so um, I just wanted, oh yeah, it's on the tilt all tripod, which is a very uh, steady uh, tripod and it works fairly well. So that other image that I was just showing uh, before, where is it? Um, this is my first light of that uh, barn door drive, and I'm pretty happy with it. It's not, you know, it's not super duper quality, but hey, it's a barn door. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is, these are uh, four five minute exposures stacked at 75 millimeter. It's of the Sadr region. So this star that you see here is Sadr. And further down, um, uh, I've got some things in the way. Well, that, that's Deneb uh, down here. If you can see it, I don't mm -hmm. know. So. I can't get the cursor door there because on my desktop there are some things in front of it from from Zoom that I can't get. Rid of. Anyway, the the one at the lower left, and over there to the right there is some some very flimsy. Uh, there's a wisp of of, of uh, purple. That's the veil nebula. This is the mm -hmm. east uh, veil, and that is the western veil up there. And I've compared it with some other pictures that I saw on the web, for, uh, and, and and these things are you know these features are there so. So it's all good. And I think, you know, for, for five minute exposures, that's not bad at 75 millimeter, fairly round stars. So, so that's a success. After all the trouble that I did to get my newt working, uh, I, I was longing for something simple and something that I can throw in a backpack and take somewhere and that's foolproof. So this is it. Yeah. And when you make them foolproof, that usually doesn't account for me. So. <laughs> okay. Well, so Hank, uh, show that at uh, actual pex pixels. Go go to go to full resolution on that. Okay. This is not pixels, but I mean, um, but this is the full resolution if that's what you. So in the upper left, I mean, the the shape of the stars is slightly elongated, uh, but not horribly. I mean, uh, if you see that uh, the resolution that we saw earlier, then you can't even see it. Uh, so the, it's like a stress by a factor of 1.5 or so, but off to the right, it's different. So there is some twisting going on, unless maybe my zoom lens is not uh, has, has a twist in it. Uh, maybe there's some flexure. See, if you go further to the right now, definitely the, the tracks are worse here. I mean, you can see more, it's more elongated as a, by a factor of two. And to the lower left, it's actually almost round. So mm -hmm. not quite symmetrical. But were, these taken, were, the, were these taken straight up or were they taken low in the sky? Uh, pretty much straight up, yeah. Okay. yeah. Did you stop the, uh, the lens down? Mm, no, no, okay. no. Maybe I could have done that. But I, the biggest problem really is, is with, the, with the tracking because I started out with a uh, screw that I had made of a, 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 a 20, 20 threads per inch rod with a blob of epoxy at the top. And mm -hmm. I had pressed the shaft of the motor into it uh, pretty much in the middle. But when I looked closely, well, first I found out that that thing actually caused uh, tracks. So it, it, I, I saw a wiggle in there and it was like exactly every 43 seconds, which is the period of, of the, of the uh, screw. And uh, so that was caused by, because it was slightly off center, but maybe by half a millimeter, maybe by a millimeter or so. So I redid the screw and what I did is I put a bolt, a, a nut on top and pressed the epoxy in there so I could center it in the nut and that uh, worked much better. So that, that, that reduced a whole bunch of uh, uh, trails that I, I would otherwise have had. So the, the mechanical part is still the weakest. I don't think it's the optical mm -hmm. uh, that's the problem. But I think, you know, for a barn door drive, this is pretty much as good as it gets. Uh, I, maybe I can work on the focus a little bit, but uh, 
if you the, the, the trouble well one thing is that the trouble of uh, polar alignment um i'm using my telrad and it has uh you guys all know telrad right it's got three circles on it and the second one is the i think it's the one degree circle um but i have to you know what i do is i look up the position of polaris in stellarium relative to the northern celestial pole and then i sort of try to aim it so that you know uh, the you know, you know what I mean, but I have to eyeball that, and I think I can easily get an, uh, an error of like 20 arc seconds or something like that. 10 arc seconds is probably as, uh, sorry, minutes. 10 arc minutes is probably as, as accurate as it gets. Well, Hank, so, there certainly is a lot of color in all the stars there. I'm just yeah, amazed yeah. the range range of color there. Me too. Uh, it's, it, I, I uh, edited in uh, DSS, and uh, I cranked up the uh the saturation quite a bit uh but uh, i don't i don't think it's out of the that it's uh are you sure they're not hot pixels oh those would not all be hot pixels no i mean <laughs> no um well i mean this this color here is clearly hydrogen alpha it's alpha right and the black is also explainable and 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 you know blue is not out of the question either and and yellow i mean i think the the color of the stars is fairly natural maybe a little oversaturated but not horribly i think um but uh yeah I, i'm just amazed how many stars there are in that region and now i also understand why it's so difficult to get a nice picture of the veil nebula because it's right a it sits right on top of a whole field of stars over there. So <laughs> without filters, you, you really get uh, fat stars. That's what happens to me usually. Did you do this from home? Yeah, just from my driveway. Yeah, so by the way, this was also do done during the full moon. So uh, it's far from ideal. Yeah. Wow. Well, full moon or, uh, well, it was uh, last week, uh, I think a week ago or so that, you know, at least more than half full, I think. So again, the exposure was what five minutes um it was four times 280 seconds to be precise but i wanted four or five times five minutes but it got 20 seconds off for some reason i don't know why but yeah so uh so almost 20 minutes altogether stacked and i used i used four flats and uh two darks it makes a difference but anyway, I'm pretty happy with uh, the tracking because that mm -hmm. seems to be fairly well. Yeah. Now this is uh, your your Arduino's comp is is doing the the tangent compensation, correct? Or is yes. This, yes. Know. Yeah. The Arduino does that, and I would like to uh, start working with a longer uh, rod. This one is only for good for like 35 minutes, I believe. But I would like to go to at least an hour of worth of exposure. So I, I'm I'm going to get a longer. Uh, rod and then uh, I have a better chance to test the algorithm than to make sure that it's okay. But it, you know, it's pretty straightforward, so I don't think I made any mistakes in that. And you would see it. So it's not too bad for you know uh, a simple oh. bar door drive with a motor of like two two dollars or something like that. And especially a zoom lens. Yeah, They're noted for quality. I, yeah, I, I tested with three at 300 millimeters as well, but then you can't mm -hmm. really go to five minutes. That's a bit, of, you know, then you're pushing it too much. Um, yeah. And uh, despite the fact that it's on a decent tripod, that it, it, you, you still, it still has flexibility. So now, how do you focus that with a zoom lens in it? I, it does, there's no stop when you're at infinity. You have to somehow examine the image. Right. So, what I did was, um, uh, well, first of all, if you if you have the chance to you if you have a really bright star in there, so the first night I, I use Jupiter, and that's so bright that you can actually use yeah. the full uh, length. Uh, so you know the, the, the brightness is fairly low at that uh, focal length, but Jupiter is so bright that it's not a problem. So that worked well the first time, and later on uh, when I didn't have Jupiter in the image, uh, what I did is I went down to seventy five millimeters, and at that you know at that f ratio you'll you'll see some stars. And I focused that, and then I just used the zoom to go to 300 millimeter. And apparently, the zoom is set up in such a way that it retains the focus. So it's par focal. Hmm. I think so. Event. I mean, I, I tried it, and it seems to work. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to try it again in the daytime. And what I should do is really I should focus in the daytime and put a piece of tape on it, and then just use it at night. Yeah, there's no way to lock down a zoom lens. 
But you would probably use a button off mask too, maybe. Um, uh, you, would need a, you would need a bright star to do it on like Jupiter, like he did. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I should, maybe I should use a button off mask. Yeah, I have a small button off mask from my uh, red cat. Maybe I could use that for it. Yeah. But also, guess I think the limit is still in the tracking. You can you can tell it from the star. So, uh -huh. yeah. and also, you know, this, the 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 diameter of the objective is also small enough that that at some point you're going to hit that uh, uh, the the early criterion. I think. Anyway, it was just a fun little project. Yeah, seems to good work. work. Yeah. Just to show you some other barn doors that people have built here, kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. How cool. Looks like the same sort of mount that way. Do you have any pictures of the barn door thing that uh, Zoe built back in 2014? Oh, probably somewhere. Want me to find one of those? If it's easy. Just, uh, just a second. OK, because I saw a, a gear there, right? I mean, the. The nice thing about the one that I built is it has no gears at all because that little motor has uh, um, a, a 64 times gear internally. So, I mean, I see that red uh, cogwheel over there. And so, oh yeah, so it's probably a, a, a curved rod driven by that. Uh, yeah, so you need you need gears for that one, which I think, you know, is always a pain to, to add. So that, that looks like it's a YouTube video that you can see, I guess. <clears throat> right. Well, so so in the older days of the barn door drives, they had all kinds of tricks to make the, uh, to you know, if you had no circular rod, that they had like double barn door drives or whatever they did to 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 uh, make the approximation as good as possible. But if you have an Arduino, you can simply program it and you can work with a straight screw. So that saves you a whole lot of mechanical trouble, and uh, so that's kind of nice. Well, looks like this guy used Arduino, but he did the double hinge. That's. Uh, Meant to, to use an auto guider with, I, I bet. Yeah, auto guide. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I've been thinking about that as well. But if you want to do that, then you need an extra computer uh, to take with you. You need an, you know, at least a Raspberry Pi or something like that. And then the whole portable aspect is sort of going to hell. Here's a curved screw. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Pretty amazing. Yeah, it looks like the kind of stuff. The one with the curved screw was using the same kind of motor that I'm using. It's a very popular motor, actually. So <laughs> yeah. You have to get the curve just right. Yeah, and and the other thing that makes it hard is you know you have to, uh, you need those yeah you just need those gears and how would you reset it? I mean, if you reset it, you have to turn those gears in this case, which is rather painful uh in my case i just uh, take the motor outside the the threaded blob of the, the blob of epoxy and just manually just screw it back so that's pretty easy <laughs> amazing all right stop sure of that yeah but anyway you know a, a good barn door is uh, is a fun thing to do and you see a lot more a hell of a lot more than you thought i mean just from the image that I showed you, then you just realize, okay, it, it looks dark over there. It's all black, but there's a whole lot, there are a whole lot of stars. <laughs> but you have no idea there are. Jerry, you making any progress on your Uber scope? We, um, I'm trying, I've got my drawings at a machine shop and they're just not working on it. It's been almost a month. So I just sent them another hot email today and uh, we did get uh, the roll off roof observatory in the backyard approved by the HOA. Hmm. So, and uh, I'm getting a permanent pedestal to set the, in that roll-off thing, and 
I should get that around the end of September. Other than that, I just curse the fog and the clouds. Well, we've been having the smoke up here. Actually, I was in your, your guys' uh, uh, backyard uh, last week. Uh, I actually went, the reason why I wasn't uh, in class last week is I went down to Southern California to work on my mom's house and, uh -huh. and visit some people. And actually, I saw Tom. <laughs> Tom. As in, yes. Tom, Whittem Tom Whittemore? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He didn't mention that. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. I spilled the beans. No, I was going to go tell you guys, and then um, all of a sudden, uh, the, you know, it, it, when you plan a trip like I have, okay, it starts out with just one or two people. We'll have plenty of time. And Been then there. all of a sudden, it just it, becomes it, an expedition. It, yes. And yeah, that there and there was plenty of friends I wanted to see, and I, and, and we couldn't. And, and part of it had to do with things working on my uh -huh. my mom's house and fixing things and, and in laws. You know. So so you yeah. wanted to see the barn door of Zoe. Here's a, a shot. I think she was giving her talk at the museum there. Yeah, and that's a picture of it behind her. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Speaking about talks, uh, things are still pretty closed up at the uh, museum. Yes. Yeah. They had originally planned to open the museum up for activities starting this fall around October 1st, but um, they're not going to do that now because of the new Delta variant that's spiking down here. Oh, there's there's what there's another variant uh, making appearance too. Yeah, in South Africa, it's got a different name. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it it looks like the uh, Pfizer vaccine only protects for forty two percent, which is actually below the threshold of what seems to be acceptable for a vaccine. So, mm -hmm. we're basically pretty much unprotected, even when you have the until Pfizer. we get a third even shot. Like, Moderna is like seventy six percent or something like that, so that's a lot yeah. better. I, I think I have the Pfizer. I think no matter what vaccine, you were very happy to get it in the beginning. Just yeah. because it afforded you. No, I have the Pfizer too. My my 16-month-old grandson, when he was 15 months old a month ago, he got COVID Delta. And uh, it was a very mild case, but it actually stunned us all because we are so careful. We mm -hmm. could not and everybody was tested around in our bubble. Nobody has it. We have no idea. It just must have come from a puff of air out of some runner as he went by and Calvin picked it up or something. Just a fluke thing. Well, so, but he's fine now. Apparently, we were told by their doctor that his doctor that little babies that are 15 months old, they don't have a full immune system yet. And most of the thing that kills you in the COVID when you get it is not so much the disease, it's your body's immune system reacting overly much. You know, it's, it becomes allergic to it. And that's what fills you with fluid. But since his was so immature, none of that happened. He just had like what he looked like a real mild cold and a few days of listlessness and slept a lot. So here's hoping. Yeah, so they're up, when they start up, let me just finish this one point. When they when the museum starts up again, they're going to um, for some reason they need more space and they're very limited in um, how much how many people they can have on site at a time. Yeah. And so the work this workshop is now going to have to be this way forever. The Broder, using Broder Hall for it again is no longer an option, which is fine with me. But we will get back to having our monthly meetings in Farrand Hall if we ever get control of these uh, pandemics. Yeah. So, because we're now back, here. we're now back at the same level as um, you know the worst part of last year. Yes. So if you look at the number of infections, it is actually maybe even worse than the worst yeah. 
that we had so far because now we're going to have Labor Day. So if you look at the curve, then from last year, you can see the Thanksgiving spike, then the uh, early December spike for the people who traveled before Christmas, and the, then the January spike for the people who yeah. traveled back after Christmas. And you'll see the spikes. So we're going to have a spike for, for Labor Day, and it's going to be, yeah. you know, and in the in the winter, you know, it's going to be, everything's going to be much worse. So it could be really for the holidays, be, yeah. Now, the, yeah. The, the Pfizer does only give you 42 or 50 percent, what I heard, but yes. it prevents death. It prevents the severe cases. So what's happening is that unvaccinated people are carrying, doing the heavy lifting with dying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> on that pleasant note. <laughs> You know, Tim, Tim Crawford was talking about last week about his uh, controlling his LED for, um, for um, on, his, on his tester, Ronky tester, whatever. Yeah. And, I, and I found the little gizmo that, uh, that does the um, pulse, width, pulse width modulation uh, okay. control. It's like seven bucks on, on Amazon. One of these things, mm -hmm. I don't see, see the detail on it or not. Yeah. Just to... Input and output, and little little uh, potentiometer. Uh, yeah. Dial it in, and and maybe that might uh, control the LED image uh, intensity. But uh, is the LED uh, typically is it uh, if you uh, if it goes below three volts, is it just plain turn off? I mean, so so you're you're keeping the voltage is steady. Threshold. You're doing pulse width modulation to uh, control the intensity. The duration so that it's on. Yeah. That, so that, control, that controls the intensity. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't find any LEDs around here and got a power supplies, but I, I thought I had a couple around here somewhere. Go over to that electronic store over by the um, airport. airport. Is yeah. that still called Marvac Dow? Is that the same? No, one? it's got another name like Santa Barbara parts or something like that yeah, santa barbara electronics yeah. yeah santa barbara electronics yeah and and there's another one actually on, on hollister uh if you go towards uh, yeah further towards costco from there it's on the right hand side um huh. yeah I, I went there a few times okay that's, that sounds new uh, when i was working down there the, um, the only thing was that place at the airport because Morvac had uh, closed down. Yeah. Right. Well, at least you have something like that there. There's nothing up here. I'm sure there has to be something up there like that. Yeah, I've been looking. It, but the, <laughs> I, I think Fry's kind of muscled all of them out and then it went belly up. <laughs> it's, it's like... Uh, it's like border books, you know, when borders books came out, they, uh, they basically took out most of the mom pop places like um, the earthling. Yes. I was going to mention that. And then they went belly up and, you know, all he had was Barnes and Nobles left. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the other one is called California electric supply and it's on Hollister. Whereabouts? Uh, it's, um, before Los Carneros Way, if you uh, go okay. north, so first you get Willow Springs Lane, and then uh, it, then it's the next block after that. So there are okay. two little roads, and then you've got Los Carneros Way. Huh. It's the first one. It's on the first block. You have to sort of go around the back, and that then you'll see it. It sounds like so, it was near where is that where Espig used to be? Where what? Santa Barbara yes. Instrument Group. Uh, used to be oh sbig yeah that's the old clinet building oh yeah that's um i don't know it's good because be i used to i used to work at raytheon in that yeah. area you know in the three the three you know the one uh before before the airport and the the optical place and then there's a like a little foundry or whatever place that was uh uh on a back street around there, but mm. that would, yeah, you guys are lucky. You can pick up junk easy. Yeah, that's what I need a place to store my junk. 
<laughs> I think I think I'm becoming a, a, a junk hoarder. My wife's oh. probably in the other room agreeing with me, but silently. <laughs> So Jerry, yeah. you were talking about a pedestal. What kind of a pedestal are you talking about? A, a pier or a yeah, a pier. Oh, okay, okay. And you're going to pour it yourself inches, for ten inches in diameter and uh, thirty inches tall. Okay. So and you are going to pour the concrete yourself, I presume? No, I'm going to have a contract contractor pour the concrete. All right. My, uh, my body doesn't do that kind of stuff anymore. And let me off scot free the next day. So, right. Okay. Even though cool. I used to do that to make in a summer job, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. that's one thing I'd like to do with this pier is to sink it into some concrete too. But uh, I, I, I don't get a, a hall pass on that from my my better half. You know, okay. she, she wants that concrete. Christine. <laughs> now we're doing our whole backyard. We're uh, taking out a lot of lawn and we're putting in <clears throat> slate or some kind of flagstone type things and and uh, replanting a lot of stuff. So a lot of yeah, I, What's that? I have no lawn at all. No lawn. Oh, my dog needs a lawn. My cats need a lawn. So, gotta have some place for the fleas to breed. Got it. Yeah, <laughs> got to do my part for nature. So, did you need a permit? Because it's probably not going to be that big, right? If it's a roll-off shed, I mean, if you're five yeah. foot away from the perimeter, isn't that a free pass? Or <laughs> yeah, there's nothing involved of a, of a um, permit for the structure. Okay. So, so how yeah. high is the uh, walls going to be? That walls are going to be five feet high. Okay. They have to be because um, that's the fence between neighbors, and we're not allowed to obscure the view of neighbors just as they can't obscure ours. So. Oh, so this is going to be a flat roofed roll off. A very low peaked roof. Okay. A gabled roof. Um, and then it'll slide off, and uh, then the telescope will sit up. So it, it, it can fit under that roof in a, a parked position. Yeah. With the oh, that's nice because it, it, it achieves the goal that you can leave your equipment out there and you can just yes. start it. But uh, it doesn't shield the light or the wind. I mean, that's no, the, I was just looking at. Uh, I was just looking at my own scope and mm -hmm. I was measuring, and I need six and a half foot at least if I want okay. to achieve this goal. So I would probably go for seven foot tall if I were to rig yeah. something. I uh, I've been using imaging in my backyard. It's getting brighter, but um, quite successfully for years. But I deal with the brightness back there by building an extension on my tubes. So I have a 12 inch F, 12 and a half inch F6 newt that I made. It's F6, but it's got an 85 inch tube that, it, that sticks out an extra foot and a half beyond where it needs to be. And it gives very dark images because of that. And um, I've been using that stuff in the backyard for a long time. So yeah. I'm not, and I, I noticed that uh, Mike's uh, talking about sitting in his observatory. My intention is not to be in the observatory. It's just to roll the roof off. Go and it's, the house, that's easier on the computer from there. That's easier with a roll off roof, believe yeah. me. For what I've been experiencing. Yeah, like when I am out there, I like to look up at the stars and get oriented with it. I don't. Oh, I miss that too. I, you know, I would have a roll off roof in a heartbeat, except for these winds here, you know. It's just, yeah too much the wind i just don't do it on a windy night especially with the long tube that you know to block light and i have winds just about every night or yeah. if it isn't windy it, then it's uh cloudy if it's not uh -huh. cloudy then it's uh, i find there's the big three that play with me the moon uh the fog and the wind so if the moon, like right now, the moon's between last quarter and first quarter. So these are the two weeks when it's fairly dark for me. And of course, that's the time when somehow the moon seems to have a trailer hitch on the clouds and pulls them in. And uh, one time, I, one year, I got such a period of, of dark skies and no clouds, and then the hills caught on fire. And so that, that finished that off.
Yeah, well, we gotta. We still have. We're still suffering from the smoke here too. So. Yeah. No, no, our skies are free of that. Well, not when I was down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's not free. Of, and it, well, and it wasn't my fault right either. now. I don't think there's any. My smoke detector is my asthma, and it hasn't been setting off. Oh, so. So none of you guys have been going to any any form of dark side except for uh, Bruce. Well, I had been planning to go to Calstar around the end of September, early October, up at Lake San San Antonio, but with COVID going, and I don't know. It depends on the weather and how I feel about that. So. And uh, speaking of dark sites, they closed all the national forests in California, so we cannot go to yeah. uh, dark sites anymore. Well, that may take care of Calstar because that's a national forest, I think. Okay, well, it will. Like yep. San Antonio, yeah. Yep, they closed it down because of the fires, and uh, they said it's uh, pretty, for now it's for two weeks, but knowing how the things last went last last right. year, it's going to be a lot longer. So, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure out which fire was the one that was set off by this gal in a bikini on drugs. What was what? Up in no Northern California, they, they caught this one and sent in a fire. She was on drugs and just in a bikini. And she was setting fire? She set fire, yeah. On purpose? Yeah. Well, maybe on her drug mind, she was, you know, it made sense, but yeah. Hmm. No. Um, Can't account for her. Yeah. Must have been bad drugs. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, kind of sad that you're not going to be able to use the Broder building in the future. Cause... Well, I don't know. This is kind of nice. Um, and we get. Um, uh, what's his name? Beam. Yeah. 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 And uh, Bob Richard and stuff, people that can't drive all the way here from where they are. And it makes for a, a steadier client, you know, um, pre, uh, attendance. Well, an another thing, too, is not too many people are really working on mirrors nowadays. No. Uh, Matter of fact, I'm going to take all my mirror working stuff over and give it to Tom Whittemore. <laughs> Don't tell him. Don't tell him I'm going to do that. I want to surprise him. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been threatening to to, to work on this ten inch, and uh, I just haven't had the time. And I still need to make or or purchase an, um, a three axis uh, stage for my uh, uh, my interferometer so that I can. Oh yeah. yeah, at least test them. Yeah, that that's that was the that was the vein. I you know I can't believe how far off my mirror was when I thought it, I had reasonable uh, hmm. data. So I I know I have a I, I know I have an issue trying to read. Uh, the Foucault test of my my eyes aren't all that great. Yeah, it's not just you. That's a that's a tough measurement to make. It requires patience, and you have to do it a lot at a time in order to, to develop the. Fine. Oh, I was doing it for hours and hours. But okay, it, that was just it was just way. I'm over trying to work. make you look good, and you're blessing my attempt here. No, no, no. I'm I'm the type that shoots myself down, and you know, in the, in the job. Okay. <laughs> But the, the interferometer should be a lot better. And of course, star testing, hey, that's what got me to where I, yeah. I got to be. So uh, still have that other 14 inch. Tom, would you find a new galaxy back there? Yeah. I have this uh, Celestron uh, controller. I got one of those. <laughs> and. Uh, is it only good for the uh, the fork mount uh, mounts? Is that was that what this was for? It's made for AC synchronous motors, okay, and some of the and some of the old uh, 
German equatorial mounts also use those same motors. Oh, really? And, yeah. And uh, the, the other control on it with the, the little box uh, was a DC motor for the declination. Huh. I'm guessing it has a wine bridge oscillator in there to change the frequency. Yeah, yeah, I've got that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, you, you, you control the frequency with, with two buttons and then you control a little DC voltage forward and reverse with the other. And if you remember the old fork mounts, um, it was pretty fine pitch for the, the declination, had a long, you know, swing arm that, that moved it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyways, um, this, this week, I'm, um, somebody contacted me about going to another person's place, uh, uh, the daughter of somebody who was uh, an active amateur. He passed away and they're trying to figure out what to do with the stuff. And so they don't know what they have, what's valuable. And so we're going to go tell them. But I have this, I have this feeling that for some young people, um, all the, you know, and, um, all they have to do is follow the ambulances or the hearses. <laughs> they can get uh, equipment for cheap. And it, it used to be a joke at the Trilogy here that you could always get a good deal on a golf cart just by following um, um, the EMT in, in Trilogy. <laughs> somebody, somebody kicks the bucket, you know. I thought only lawyers did that. Oh. Ambulance chasers. No, no, well, actually we didn't, uh, we didn't do that when we got ours. Uh, um, just to say, it's the guy who, you always have somebody that fixes up the stuff and then sells it. But after we bought ours, he got a heart attack. And so oh. he's out of business. It's kind of a grim joke, but it's, it's true. You know, there's a lot of us. Yeah. Um, well, the best thing we can do is, especially in this economic situation, is sometimes, you know, encourage kids or one, one of the things we're probably going to do with whatever equipment this guy has is contact um, some of the local libraries and see if they want the equipment. Um, the one in Rio Vista, you know, I was in contact and we were going to do public outreach and there's little towns like Cortland and I mean, there's like Two or three hundred people, maybe five hundred people at the most. Mm. They all have a Carnegie Library, you know, because that's what Carnegie used to do: is build libraries everywhere. Oh yeah. And um, so, you know, they're dealing with the issue of how do we how do we encourage them, you know, and students, you know, the sciences and all that. They don't they don't have the resources because they don't have the um, the money and you know just donating a telescope would help them you know um, it's sort of like a, you know what SBAU does in a way where you know you have the outreach and you go to the the, the Cub Scouts or the you know the, the schools or whatever you know did that used to do that with the DCAS in Cedar Valley and that was very important to, to get kids interested in sciences and stuff like that. Anyways. I'm surprised they don't do science fairs beyond elementary school in general. You don't see that. Maybe there's one school, Pioneer High School, that has science projects, but it's it's amazing that they don't do that. All the high schools have science fairs and can continue that on. Well, they do. I, Dos Pueblos has a science fair. My I've never seen went, that. Daughter really? And she, yeah, I was up all night doing her science project. No, she, she, she did a science project, graduated in 2005. I don't know if they still do it. But was there a science, you know, like a poster set up, you know, like they, yeah. you know, the, there was. Yeah, and so. Michael's crafts 
sells the foam core board that's in three panels so it opens up and stands up and stuff so right science huh. fair yeah. because you know, you, know we, who does, we... you know who does the science holdups and all that i just happened on um when i was still down with you guys they had this big symposium on research done by the the, the hubble telescope yeah or was it or was it it was one of the the spacecraft that you know, went offline, and there's. I, I still have the pictures that I took. I walked in there, and they had this whole sit, a multi day symposium, all on the fact that people were doing professionals were doing research, and they all had their poster boards, you know, just like high schoolers, you know, each one with their own, you know, this is what we did, this is what we did, you know. Uh -huh. I thought it was pretty. Yeah, the, the, I think I saw that uh, Los Cumbres Observatory was showing some of those posters that people were doing the exoplanet discovery. I think with a whole bunch of people are involved. That's but what yeah, I, I think, doing. yeah, Jerry, I think you're right. That, I mean, I remember at the science fair when we judge it at the UCSB for the county yeah. Yeah. that there was some high schoolers there. But I think it was like Pioneer High School. But Zoe, hmm. I'm not sure what school she went to. to she went to Dos Pueblos. To, was uh, it, it only happens when the teachers and the administrators <laughs> know something about it and they yeah. get good uh support from the parents i mean like in rio vista i mean our school system gets an f and it, there's they have events for you know raising money for the uh um for the sports and all that, but the budget is so low and the, um, you might say the background of the parents and the people living here just doesn't support high quality education. I mean, they're all farmers or workers, um, you know, uh, farm workers, uh, your, your typical poor town folk, you know, I guess, you know, we, we never do any outreaches for high schools. We do have a junior high or two that we go to, but high schools don't have any telescope outreaches or some well, kind we, of science we nights. Do, we do do them for UCSB. And you yeah. do do it for our, for that school in... Um, Tate? Uh, uh, Ojai. Ojai, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, but that's, those are at places where they've, they have the, the teachers and the personnel that know about it and they need oh, it's something yeah they know enough to go and ask you guys to help them out you know they and you know you you help complete what they need to accomplish but there's yes i knew a, i knew a teacher in elementary school when my kids were there for the sixth grade and she was told to give them a unit on astronomy and she didn't even know what an astronomer was called. She she had posters made up that showed them as astronomists. Since they were <laughs> since they were scientists, then they must be astronomists. And that was her depth of understanding of astronomy. That's amazing. Well, we we do we do have this issue on and yes. um, what was it on sixty minutes last night? They had a thing where. They were interviewing. Um, they had the, the big thing about chip shortages, you know, and there's only, you know, the big three of which Intel's one, TMSE is another, and I think it was Samsung or his number three. I, I could be wrong on the number three, but they interviewed this guy. Um, they asked him some hard questions, you know. Um, and basically, he boiled down to, he says, look, you know, in the United States, we, we know that we're beating you as far as technology. He says, you guys got to, basically, he says, you guys got to step up the plate and graduate more scientists and yes. technical people to keep up. When and, I was at, uh, are you through or did you, we're going to say something additional? 
Oh, when I was at Raytheon, as I retired, I was a department manager of systems engineering. And that at the department level, we're responsible for hiring and finding people, firing too, but I hated that. But um, we could, we would go to these symposiums on uh, personnel availability. And at that time in 2006, the estimate was that the US was 1 million scientists and engineers short. That is, we had a million unfilled jobs in science and engineering here. And the trend was that it was only gonna get worse. Now it's it good has. for the scientists and engineer because the salaries are so high, but uh, still. Well, there, I, I, I do know I have a couple of friends that are older than me, engineers, uh -huh. and uh, they got hired full time, you know, um, but that's not a solution is to keep people like me employed. It's to, it's, it's to make it feasible for other people, um, the young people. And, and part of it is it's so doggone expensive to go to school now. I mean, uh, and, uh, I think a lot of the students, because they're afraid that they might fail at tough courses, they take other courses that are easier, that guarantees them a yeah, graduation. They don't, they don't prepare them for high paying jobs though. No, uh, that's true. And that's, and you're right. And that's another big problem with this country. We've got a lot of students, even in technical areas where, they're under a massive amount of debt. So I think the solution would be, and, and I think some of the conservatives may not like it, but you basically partially or fully um, bankroll um, some of the degrees and areas that we need. In other words, hmm. you know, and, and, and STEM, in, in other words, give them a financial break yeah. So that they're more likely to go in there and graduate. Some schools now, if you want to major in engineering or medicine and stuff as a pre-med, you have to pay a premium above tuition to be in that because yeah. the people that you want teaching those classes can make a lot more money outside of the university that if they're actually doing the job in industry. So the school has to pay them enough so you have the brightest people uh, doing the teaching. So it's, it's a real problem. Uh, other countries are more socialistic than we are about that. And I don't know what the results are compared to that because I know that a lot of foreign students want to come to the US for our schools. Well, there's some backlash on that and some of them are not, they're going back to yeah, the well, country. They, they, they're, funded, they're funded by their, their, their country. And then when they leave the country, to go to the US for school, they have to sign an agreement and have some kind of collateral that they're gonna come back, like your family's here and they can't move or something like that. But some people do leave and it was a controversial about two administrations ago about every time a foreign student graduated from a US university with a PhD, they should be given a job offer and US citizenship, but it never went anywhere. I mean, yeah. people recognize the problem, but I don't think anyone has the solution. They, they, well, when it comes to money, they don't want to talk about it. And uh, uh, let's face it, a lot of uh, students in the United States, even if they're second generation um, family, um, students don't want to do that. They, they, they want to go off and do other things that are, are more glamorous or uh -huh. they think might make them more money to begin with, you know. Well, I think there are huge problems with the education in the US and it's not just with universities, but with high school from the ground up. So let me just explain how it was in the Netherlands in the time when, when I grew up. So when after you do elementary school through the first six grades and they give you an IQ test and you see what uh, what you're capable of and then then you get go to high school, but it's all vertically arranged. So you've got about 10 uh, levels basically based on intelligence and it's very competitive so uh, you you get selected in the in the first year you 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 get more or less selected but you can still switch but then after that you're stuck in that 
particular vertical level and, and you go up. Uh, it's not always the same number of years. And at the end, then, then you can switch. So th that way, you know, everybody gets uh, the education at the level that they're good at and, and they're not being held back or, you know, uh, vice versa. And that, that makes the whole thing much more efficient. And only the highest two levels are allowed to go to the university. So if you're not there, then you won't be able to, to go to the university. The universities, there, there's, um, they were, you know, they're all basically public and there's a, there are committees that make sure that the education level of all the universities is basically the same. So there's not, you, you won't have that, you have to go to Stanford or it's not good enough or something like that. It's all more or less the same and it's a good level. So that way the whole system becomes much more efficient and, and there's much less waste and much more, much less doubt about, you know, you have to go, you have to be here because, you know, people are paying millions to go to Stanford or, or Berkeley or all this kind of stuff, you know. Anyway, so, so let that, me ask you in the Netherlands, Netherlands, you said? Yes. Um, are there more people going into, as Mike put it, the harder subjects like math and engineering, STEM classes, or do they pick them as a child, you know, an under, you know, someone early in their career when they might be intrigued more by art or something? So the first four years of high school, uh, it's all, at least the, the kind of high school where I went, it's all fi a fixed curriculum. So you get like uh, quite a few languages. I had okay. Latin, Greek, don't know. <laughs> it's all pretty horrible. French, German, uh, English, Dutch. Um, you took all those languages? I took all those languages. It was horrible. I hated languages. But anyway, you have to do it. It was mandatory. And after the fourth uh, grade, then you can select again. So the last two grades of the high school, that's when you start specializing in uh, science and math or uh, and it was usually kind of interesting to see that a lot of the ladies just do languages and, and, and economics and that kind of stuff. And uh, a lot of the guys do go the other way, science and uh, medicine and so on. So, yeah, um, that's when you get to choose. But other than that, before that, is, it's fairly uniform. Have they decided that there's, they're turning out too few engineers or scientists over there? Or do they not care about that? Um, well, the... In my days, the education was, the whole university education was basically free. I mean, you pay maybe, yeah. well, it, it became more expensive, like to the point that you had to pay like 2,500 guilders per year, which was huge. <laughs> but before that, it was much less even. So it's basically free. Um, okay. I understand Germany right now is free uh, university for everyone. You, can, you could go over there in the United States and get a free education in Germany. Yeah. Yeah, so if you, you know, set up your educational system that you get the right people in the right place, then you can be a hell, hell of a lot more efficient and, you know, mm -hmm. and all this nonsense about, you know, because the universities here, they try to be like commercial companies, they attract students from yeah. abroad and it's all it's it's just horrible. Yeah, it's a business. And we all get screwed over by that, you know, I mean, we're supposed to pay taxes for to let our own children go to the university. Well, my son luckily went to UCSB, but it's not a given, you know, it's, it's just... Anyway, don't get me started on this whole educational system. Okay. A disaster. Well, uh, well, at least in uh, Netherlands must be doing pretty good technically because they're the ones that make all the semiconductor uh, uh, lithography uh, machines that everybody wants to get. You know, they're on the cutting edge. As ASML, as, ASML, yeah. Yeah, AMSML, yeah. Yeah, they make the best... Uh, to make the best etchers or whatever processing. Right. Yeah. Is the Philips company out of Netherlands? Yes. Yeah, I like Philips products. Oh yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Um, I'm just looking, yeah, the, the, have you heard of the LOFAR radio telescopes? I think it's called LOFAR, let me just look that up. Recently, they that that was also invented in the Dutch in, in the Netherlands, yeah. LOFAR large radio telescope network. It's kind of interesting. So, recently, um, an interesting image was uh, uh shown on the internet. I don't have the link right now, but these are antennas that are you know they they uh are based on it's based on radio interferometry somehow, and they're just vertical poles in a little wow. square pad, and they've got a whole lot of them. And altogether, they function like a, a telescope of the diameter of the, you know, where, as large as that area is. But they put yeah, them. they're phase locked receivers. Yeah. Yes, 
phase array. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And they can, uh, you know, observe in different directions and so on, yeah. and uh, multiple uh, targets simultaneously. And uh, okay, I see a link here. Most detailed ever images of galaxies revealed using LoFAR. Yeah, I can maybe share that link if I see uh, something interesting. Oh yeah. I think there's another Netherlands company called Delft. Delft uh, Electronics. Okay, yeah, Delft is the name of the technical university where I got my PhD. Okay, well, it was a company back in the at the start of the Iraqi War, and several of the um, several Iraqi weapons were captured that were infrared oh. night vision scopes. Oh, really? And they, they were made by Delft and they had on the back of each of the chips in the fact they had Santa Barbara Research Center on the Mercad Telluride steps. And so that became a big scandal. And, you know, how did how did it happen? And it turned out they, they checked it and it turned out Hughes was lied to about who was going to get those when they were sold. And so Delft was put on a blacklist for oh, any my. U.S. technical cooperation for, I think, for 10 years. Yeah, I don't know if they really did it, but they were the bag. They ended up holding the bag. Yeah, and then there was uh, another scandal. Actually, there was the UCN, I believe, uh, where they made the ultra centrifuges for, um, for you know. Um, oh yeah, for nuclear fuel. For, uh, for nuclear fuel. Iran. Yeah. And and they had a spy working for them from I think from Iran or from Iraq. I'm not quite sure. Uh -huh. no, Iran, I think. And he left with all the secrets, and you know. So now. <laughs> All the ultra centrifuges that they have in Iran is, you know, partly due to that. Anyway, yeah, that's also pretty sad. But apparently, he supplied that information to the U.S. too, because we knew how to spin their centrifuges up, so they all went crazy and broke. Oh yeah, <laughs> With the stuck nets, stuck yeah. something. Yeah, there's this virus. Yeah. Virus. Yeah. So Jerry, yeah. see, September seventeenth is the, the closure right now. Right. Closure. So Calstar oh, should be after oh, I that. See. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's till September 17th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Calstar, yeah. I think, is the first new moon in October. Well, we're getting to the end of the evening. Oh, Hank has got something here. What's yeah, here? I had this uh, one uh, LOFAR image that I wanted to. I, I just found a page that has a bunch of these. Mm -hmm. I didn't really read the text. Uh, this, these images are usually a combination of optical and what they see with the low far. So it's, I don't know exactly which is which, but uh, high, it about says high resolution. resolution. Yep. With low far. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, it's uh, yeah, radio galaxies. Wow. Now that's high resolution. Yeah, apparently. So that that's pretty good. If uh, yeah, you know, those kinds of things here too. Anyway, I thought it was interesting, and uh, it's it's pretty natural that they do that in the Netherlands because it rains all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, they have to use radio radio telescopes then. Yeah, yeah, and I think actually these are in the millimeter area. I'm not quite sure. I'd have yeah. to check. Yeah, that goes through clouds too. Right, right. Anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah, it is. It's fairly new, but uh, yeah. All right. That's okay. So well, I'm going to go and uh, ring off. Oh, but yep. We'll see you guys next week, maybe. And See you all again next week. All right. All right. Bye. Glad we dropped in. Thank you. See you guys later. Bye. See you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.